Okay, so the next part here is we're going to look at the dead time. And what is dead time? Dead time, or transport delay, or time delay, this, this can result when you have uh, basically a plug that has to flow through a pipe. So if you think about a plug flow reactor, then as that plug is flowing through the reactor, you don't know anything about that plug until it gets to the end of your pipe. In the same way, if you have some sort of change happening to your process, let's say um, you, know, you have some sort of change here in the flow rate at time t equals zero, and then something changes about what's going on inside the reactor, and then you want to know, uh, you have a sensor for, let's say, maybe a concentration changes inside this reactor, and you have a sensor for that concentration change way over here. That sensor will not know anything about what's going on in the, react in the reactor for the time that it takes for that change to flow through this pipe and finally get to the sensor. That time delay is called dead time. In this case, the dead time, which is often denoted as theta, is equal to the distance here in the pipe that it has to flow, divided by how fast the fluid is going through the pipe. Or another way to look at it would be um, your density of your fluid times the cross-sectional area of your pipe, all divided by your mass flow, F, times L. Right? So here would be 1 over your velocity. Now, this is an example of dead time. It's a very common example of dead time, but it's not the only example of dead time. So we might um, have dead time appearing in other places in our uh, class, but suffice it for now to say that if you do have uh, dead time in your system, and let's say, for example, that this was the, the, the cause of the dead time and your sensor was very, very fast, so you don't have to worry about the dynamics of the sensor itself. All we're worrying about is this dead time here then the dead time would be modeled by this pure delay equation where the sensor value at time t is equal to the actual value at time t minus your dead time. So dead time ago. Now the Laplace transform of a pure delay is going to give you a, an exponential in your uh, Laplace domain. So if we want to Laplace transform this time delay, that's equal to the Laplace transform of the variable without time delay times e to the time delay, in this case minus theta, because you had a minus theta here, times s. Now, of course, you can't have a plus theta. You're not going to have um, inverse time delay because then you would have information before it happened, of course, right? So every time you have time delay, you have a minus theta there, and then the minus theta appears there. So to finally finish out this line, what you get is y of s, capital Y of s, times e to the minus theta s. And that would be the Laplace transform of our time delay relation. So therefore, the transfer function between your sensor value and your um, input value, or your, uh, sorry, your output value, is your transfer function for dead time is equal to e to the minus theta s. Now, as we described in earlier topics, some analyzer sensors, things like gas chromatographs, themselves have a time delay associated with them, and so just theta would change in this relationship. So you have time, time delay or dead time because of the flow through there, and dead time because of the analyzer sensor itself. Now, there are some cases in which the dead time of the system is very important to take into account. And the reason why is that dead time can really, really affect the dynamics of your system, it can really affect the poles of your transfer function. It's easy to see why, because every, now, um, every transfer function that we looked at up until now has been some sort of ratio, and usually the denominator has been a polynomial, right? So a generic transfer function might look something like some constant k over some second order polynomial s squared plus as plus b. Well, now, in addition to that, we're going to have an exponential term in our transfer function, and that will drastically change what are the poles of our transfer function. Okay, but besides that, besides going all mathy about it, intuitively, 
Under what conditions do you think you can safely ignore a dead time? And under what conditions do you think you cannot ignore a dead time? Well, it's very important to know how long is your dead time compared to how slow is your process. So one, um, one way to, to get a handle on how slow your process is, is you ask yourself, what is tau p? If my process is very fast, then tau p will be small. If my process is very slow, then tau p will be very large. Now, if tau p, our process time constant, is much, much greater than theta, or another way to say it is if our dead time theta is much, much less than our tau p, that means our process is so slow compared to the dead time, you can safely ignore dead time. On the other hand, when theta, your dead time, is on the order of your process, then you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it because a large fraction of the time that the process takes to change from one steady state to another will also be taken up by waiting for your dead time. And so when you get theta on the order of the process time constant, tau p, then you can't ignore your dead time anymore because basically everything has dead time in it, right? It's just a lot of things have just a very, 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 very small amount of dead time. But when your dead time is significant compared to how fast your process changes, then you can't ignore it anymore. Now what happens if, I didn't, the, the other thing I didn't say is what happens if theta is much, much greater than your process time constant? Well, then you're in really big trouble. And that is something that you should never, ever encounter. You should try to always avoid that system because you need to re-engineer that system. When your dead time is much longer than your process, it's a major problem. So also intuitively, think about it. Okay, so one thing that we covered in this class a lot is uh, the shower example. So um, now think about dead time in the shower example. So let's say you're sitting in your shower and your shower is too cold and so you want to turn up the heat. Okay, so you put your hand on the hot water valve and you turn up the hot water. Now if there's dead time in your system, and we've talked about this before, right? If for some reason when the water hits your skin, it takes you 10 seconds before your brain realizes how hot the water is. Then you're gonna turn up the hot water and realize, hey, this isn't changing much. And you're gonna turn up the hot water some more. And then you're gonna turn up the hot water some more, and some more, and some more. And finally, when your brain realizes and catches up to you, you're burning, right? And so that's why dead time can be a major problem if it's on the order of the process time constant or longer. Now, of course, that was kind of a fictional example when your brain wasn't working quite well. But something that might be more likely to happen is that you have as you turn up the hot water, it takes a while for that hot water to get to the shower, right? Because your hot water heater has to send more hot water. Or your, your plug of hot water hasn't gotten to the shower yet. So you're turning up the hot water more and more and more, and finally it starts to burn you. Okay, so that's what happens when your dead time uh, is longer or on the order of your process time constant. You just can't ignore it.